This is Björn Ehler's third trip back to Utøya since the massacre. Ehler is 23 years old. He survived being targeted by Breivik from close range. He was able to protect two small boys, but was a witness to carnage. Now an aspiring filmmaker, he's dedicated himself to making sure that such a massacre never happens again. One of the reasons why it's difficult for Norway to come to terms with what happened is, is that Breivik was a Norwegian, he was one of us. It might be easier for nations to deal with extremists from abroad to say that someone else did this, because then you can place the blame on someone else than yourself, while in reality what we have to do in Norway is to place the blame on Norwegian society and investigate what within our society made Breivik. Ila couldn't understand how such violence could be perpetrated in such a tranquil place. After calling his father in a panic, Ila came face to face with the gunman at the water's edge. I saw Breivik uh, come out from kind of among the trees. I thought he was a police officer at first because he was wearing a police uniform, kind of at least what was instantly recognized as a police uniform. And then I saw him lift his gun and I couldn't understand why he was doing that. Um, and I, I grabbed the two boys who were with me and, and we jumped in the water because uh, we realized he was uh, starting to shoot at us or he started shooting at us. I stood up at one point and he aimed at me and, and, and fired and I fell, but I wasn't hit. He was a terrible shot, luckily. Do you consider yourself to be a hero because of what you did with the children? People occasionally claim I am a hero, but I, I always feel that's a bit weird. Um, partially because I don't really feel like I had any other choice than to, to help the kids. Ila appears strong, but he's been diagnosed as having post-traumatic stress disorder and his mental fragility became apparent when a hunting rifle was fired in the distance. There's a shot. Yeah, that's not good. That's... okay. What did that, uh, what did that do to you? Uh, nothing good. Can we maybe stop for a bit? It makes me feel extremely unsafe. My mind knows what's going on, but my body feels all sorts of uncertainty about it. Like most of those present on Utoya, Ila was a youth member of the Labour Party. Breivik justified the attack by claiming that Labour had handed Norway to Islam. Ila has quit Labour because he believes the party has hijacked the memory of Utoya for political gain. It certainly seems like the Labour Party has tried to use this event to put himself in a position of victimhood to use the, the members of the party who died. I find that very offensive. I mean, this is a case that shouldn't be used for party politics at all. What the Labour Party is doing is stepping on the people who died, really. It also is so absurd to think that this place which united the nation, this place is going to be used to promote a political party. In common with some other survivors and bereaved families, Ila opposes Labour's plans to redevelop the island. The massacre is still fresh in the memory, and those affected still need time to mentally digest what happened. This is one of the places where um, uh, quite a lot of people got shot and, and where quite a lot of people were hiding. Um, it's one of those significant places where many got shot. This is a painful journey for Vanessa Sveback, mother of 14-year-old Sharadin, who was the youngest victim. Mrs. Sveback is still trying to piece together her daughter's final moments. At first, she was told that Sharadin had drowned while trying to escape. It took months before she learned her daughter had been shot. She ran along this trail, I guess, uh, like anyone else, hoping to find somewhere to hide. Not 100% sure what was going on. Hysterical. According to police reports and eyewitness reports, she climbed down the embankment and was shot halfway to, on her way halfway down. There are days when I thought 
the grief was going to kill me because it was painful. But the memory, her memory, is what's kept us alive. What hurts the most is that this is where my daughter drew last breath. And it's, it's something that only mothers or fathers will understand. I'm here in honour of my daughter's memory. I'm the only one that can tell the outside world who she was, what she lived for, who she loved, and what she believed in, and how she died. Her death was two hours of her life, but I had 14 years of her. Mrs. Feback believes the police operation on Utoya breached statutory obligations committing officers to protecting human life. A civil lawsuit is a real possibility. I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist to understand how devastating it is for us to know that there were many opportunities where the police could have not only stopped them and saved lives, but when there were children bleeding to death here on the island, they also stopped the ambulance being able to come over to give first aid. And consequently, children like my daughter bled to death. Do you think your daughter could be alive today? My daughter definitely would be alive today if, if she had gotten the help that she needed. As Mrs. Feback surveyed the place where her daughter was murdered, tourists followed Breivik's footsteps, their motives less sinister than Russian neo-Nazis and others who celebrate his deeds. We would like people to respect uh, what this island means to us now. This is where she died. The, her blood is here. There are people out there in the big bad world where they honour Breivik. And they come here to this island to honour him. His fans. His fan club. So I think in honour of those that died here, it should, be, should have been a priority when it first happened to secure the island. A smell of perfume and my just... Composing songs is therapy for Marit Trones, who suffered the double tragedy of having one child murdered and another wounded. Her 14-year-old daughter Elizabeth died. Her eldest, Katrina, was shot twice. She recovered physically but remains traumatised. You're a butterfly to me So free so free Every colour in my dream Decorated with Soviet-style posters honouring the purity of manual labour, the cafeteria is a time capsule still containing evidence of Breivik's merciless rampage. Elizabeth Trones was one of 13 young people murdered here. The reconstruction plans call for part of the cafeteria to be torn down and replaced, although the Labour Party says the rooms where victims died will be preserved. Uh, for me, it's very important that the island will be stående as it stands. It is very important for me that Udoya remains the way it is, because I have a need to go back to where Elizabeth was killed, to stand there and think and commemorate her. I can't cope with going to her grave to sit there with all these thoughts. But it's not only for her sake that I want to go back to Udoya and keep it the way it is. I need to process the thoughts, the experience and the grief that was inflicted upon me. Somehow Katrina plucked up the courage to accompany her mother to Elizabeth's grave. Katrina's life lost its direction after the massacre. She dropped out of school and doesn't have a job, but she's fighting for a normal existence. I have lost so many years of school. If I had managed to finish school after Udoya, I would probably have a job now and be making my own money. But I haven't. I'm just sitting here not having achieved anything. Like all of those affected by Utoya, Katrina and her mother received compensation of $47,000 from the state. But Mrs. Trunis is having a tough time financially. 
A former teacher, she's one of an estimated 50% of bereaved parents who've been unable to resume work. At this time, I can't work with children because, uh, my because of my reactions. I get easily angry, and easily cry. Christ. Um, I don't have patience. <laughs> no, I can't work. Do you think the government should make special benefits for you because of what's happened? Actually, I do. Hmm. Because this is a rich country? Yes, but also I think uh, a human life should be worth more mm -hmm. than uh, what we have got. So I got involved in the white power skinhead scene simply as a means of lashing out. Björn Ehler is committed to fighting right-wing extremism, not least because it's part of his therapy. He's formed an alliance with American Arno Michaelis, a former white supremacist, and is traveling extensively to spread the word. Here, he's in Denmark, addressing intelligence agents and social workers, working to neutralize both radical Islamists and the ultra-right. This story is my story. Uh, it's real, it's from my life, uh, but it's still an important story for all of you guys, because it explains, in many ways, why we have to do everything we can to battle extremism. This is a confrontation between anti-racists and Danish neo-Nazis in Copenhagen. European intelligence agencies report a surge of membership for right-wing groups in reaction to the rise of the Islamic State organization. Western nations are torn over which strategies to employ to thwart growing Muslim radicalization. But Björn Ehler and his new colleague are convinced that society must reach out to potential extremists within Islam and the ultra-right. They really both drive each other's recruitment, they drive each other's ideology. Rather than shun them and fear them, understand that in both groups are uh, people who need help and people who don't feel cared for, people who are marginalized. So the, the best thing you can do is to reach out and, and in, include them in your society. One of the best treatments against people who are extremists, I think, is just listening to them, recognizing them as a person, just seeing them as a human being. And some of them have never experienced that before. Although Ela says he has a big enough heart to reach out to extremists, he can never forgive Breivik. And I think we need to realize that his belief system is not unique. and, and his views are shared wild, widely um, across all of Europe, across all of the world. I completely agree. I think we sort of undervalue the extent of uh, what Bedavid believed. Are you too blind to see where everything went wrong? Don't make it happen again. This island has forever changed those who survived Breivik's fury and those whose kin did not. Their daily struggle for inner peace is aggravated by the various battles for what they regard as justice.